cold noobers. Today we're going subarctic with Josh Haley from at souls underscore untapped on Instagram. This guy, he's a frother. And uh, Jeepers, we had an absolute blast. Before we get there, a quick shout out. The Adreno Kingfish Cup uh, being held in November. The info night is on the 3rd of November at the Adreno Sydney store. It's on a Thursday from 5.30. Book that in your calendars. Um, you're likely to get a door prize just for going, walking in there and having a few beers and listening to a panel of Spiros talk all about it and um, a bunch of other stuff happening in the spe- is the Sydney spearfishing scene. So the Adreno Kingfish Cup, it's on the 3rd of November on a Thursday from 5.30. Um, get along to that. I'm still over in WA for today's episode, um, but I recorded this in advance. I really had fun ch- uh, chatting with Josh Haley. This is a really cool interview. Heaps of wicked stories. Follow him on Instagram at souls underscore untapped he's a cool guy he's dived very widely as well so it's not just subarctic spearfishing we get into um here we go let's get into this episode adreno.com.au the home of recipes blogs videos equipment reviews and an obnoxiously large range of spearfishing equipment for frothers like you not only that but spearfishing trips and courses courses and trips that i sometimes get to go on Check them out at adreno.com.au. It's a Spiro's best friend. Check them out. And if you want to buy gear, pump in the code NoobSpiro to save $20 on every purchase over $200. You can use that online, in-store. Use the code NoobSpiro, save some cash, and support the NoobSpiro podcast. Shop with adreno.com.au. Neptonics.com source the very best in spearing gear from around the planet. Jerry says, if we sell it, we believe in it, we trust it, and dive in Neptonics is the one-stop shop for all your spearfishing essentials. Neptonics is solid gear that works, and you'll know it's true when you pull the trigger on a Neptonics mech. On every snap of a Neptonics power band and in every whiz of a Neptonics spear gun reel, singing with the power of another big fish. Buy gear you can depend on at neptonics.com. Use the code NOOB10 to save 10%. G'day, no Spiro community. Today I've, uh, as usual, made a error with my scheduling and uh but josh has been kind enough to join me from the the shetlands uh this ter- I, it had nothing to do with scotland um sorry about the accent buddy that's all right i don't mind i've got a bit of a more relaxing anyway <laughs> yeah yeah i was wondering what it is because sometimes like i watch some of your youtube videos so souls untapped for people that are unfamiliar with josh's work he's got a great instagram fantastic youtube i've been enjoying catching up on it but the blokes in some of your videos have got a really broad um very yeah, sort of distinct yeah, yeah, yeah. accent and you 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 used to get a wee bit yeah i don't know what it is i was born in england but i've spent my whole life in scotland and my dad's scottish um you look at my sister she'll pick up an accent and just like that but she lives in new zealand now now she sounds kiwi uh i've kind of just stayed on one level nobody can tell what i am really <laughs> it's great so you and your family you guys all love traveling like you're very uh nomadic. yeah i love traveling it's it's mum and dad were the same they'd done australia when they were younger bought a suzuki jimny and off they went and i guess it's just in the blood and dad used to be a deep sea diver as well so i guess that ran in the blood as well mum wasn't too happy when i decided to follow his footsteps but yeah needs must so your parents still together? Yeah, yeah, yeah. They're still together. Dad's away with work a lot, but I think he's at the stage he's wanting to slow down. Yeah. He's wanting to do a lot more diving and spear fishing now. So yeah, I've seen him in Shetland in the next next month. So I've seen him pop up in a few of your vids. There was the one with the the recent one you just did, like um, like diving with dolphins, which it must it was pretty yeah, cool. Yeah, you had yeah. clean water and stuff, so it looked like a cool experience. Oh, yeah. I mean, I got to Sky a lot and to get my dad out there and Murray as well was just next. I love diving with dad because he's always like, I don't know if my sinuses will do it or, you know, not sure if I'll get down. Next thing you turn your head and he's down at 13 meters, just like, you know, <laughs> happy as Larry, just going away. So it's it's lovely to see it's he's not been commercial diving for years and years now, but yeah. it doesn't leave you yeah. just being in the water, just. A click of the fingers and he's off like he's been doing it forever. You did a bit of commercial diving in NZ, chasing Kenners, I believe, with the Herberts. Was that right? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. That was Baptisms of Fire, that was. I bet um, you. Yeah, so I ended up speaking to a few people just 
wanted to spearfish like crazy as soon as I got out there. And they're like, oh, well, give this guy a call. So I messaged Callum, who was like the supervisor at that point. Um, uh, his name's Callum Ralph. And uh, yeah, I ended up at the Herbs and right, you're going out kind of time. And I was like, yep, yeah, fine, let's go ahead. <laughs> and I was like, the, the first day or the first two days, we actually went up to the Bay of Islands. Oh, beautiful. Me being brand new, I'm just like, you know, holy crap, what have I got myself in for? Big aluminium boat, twin 300s on the back. And I'm like, you know, I've made the right life choices right now. Yeah. And uh, yeah, just started diving away. And it was just like Jurassic World for me, seeing the underwater, the kin everywhere. And then by like six months, it was a proper job. You know, my body was better at diving. You're doing a good day was four hours in the water. A long day was seven hours. We wouldn't stop. We would just get in and just dive. And then if we had any breath left, try and shoot some fish at the end of the day. Yeah. And it was, it was, it was brilliant because it taught you so much about yourself. Mm-hmm. Like I remember going through the, the hunger stages because you just wanted to get the job done, but you know what it's like when you get hangry, mm. but this time <laughs> you're alone in the water with a snorkel in your mouth, you know, your brain just goes wild. Yeah. hundred percent. But it's trying to break out those rhythms and just keep going was challenging but good fun we'll, get, we'll we'll chat more about that as we get going I, um I'm, I'm pretty interested in your part of the world the more i sort of looked into it and the more i watched your videos the more sort of curious i become because it it's a real um it's really crazy it's almost got like that norway type appeal to it but it's completely different yeah um it's subarctic sort of where you are in the shetlands uh you guys are you're, you're part of scotland but you're quite far off the mainland to the north and you guys sort of split the North Sea and the Atlantic on um, on your West Coast and you got the North Sea on your East. Is that kind of right? Yeah, yeah, that's right. There's a bit in the island that you can almost throw a stone from one to the other. Mm. It's pretty ridiculous, to be honest, up here. And I think that's maybe why I love it so much. Mm. I always say it's a bit lawless. It's maybe not the right words, but, you know, if I want to put my boat in and go spearfishing over there, I, I just do it. Yeah, or love it. If I want to go diving over there, I just do it. Um, but it's it's pretty untouched for spearfish and free dive. There's a few boys that do it, but, you know, in my head, I want to go to the top. I want to exp- experience everything, see what's out there, find the monsters lurking. And it has taken me to some ridiculous spots. So I'm trying to pioneer it. You know, a true Shetland devil not understand you going in the water and shooting a fish. You have to be on a boat with a rod and line. And that's how it's done. Well, as soon as, as, soon as people hear the words sub- arctic it's just uh it's yeah. not a huge appeal to a lot of people but for me i look at it and i just like and your 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 passion's contagious so yeah so how are you how are you winning over the locals because sometimes i bring more fish back than them <laughs> <laughs> no um because i always go on the thing is that you can't catch a fish that isn't hungry but you can shoot a fish that's not hungry so i've been out to spots and They've been fishing. It's mainly, I'll mainly shoot Pollock. Um, they call them a number of things here. Silix, Piltix. I don't know. I don't understand how they name them out here. Piltix. Um, but quite often they don't catch them as well as I can shoot them. And you know what it's like when you get to a school of fish. They can just be there and you just. Yeah. Um, so I, I first time I came back to, it was out on Murray's boat. Uh, he's a good friend of mine. And he had his dad on there and he's looking up, looking at me up and down in this wetsuit, camouflage wetsuit, spear guns, a whole lot. And he's just like, this boy's not right. You know? <laughs> and then I come back with like three, five to seven pound Pollock and his eyes just <laughs> wide open. He's just like, holy crap. You know? I watch one of your vids where you, that's dived, what I love. you dived on an army tank, like in about sort of, sort of 14, 13, 15 meters of water. That was pretty cool. Was yeah, it an army yeah, tank? Army tank uh, well, what, was it was, that? It was some sort of military. Was that up in Unst, was it? Like crystal clear water? Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so I've just been back at that. It's an army truck. Um, oh, yeah. yeah. Apparently fell off a, a barge uh, in war times, and they were just transporting them. Mm. Apparently there's two, but I've only dived one. And it's on a sandy seabed. It's really weird. It's just been plonked on its back. All mm. the levers are there for the crane and stuff. And it's, I love diving wrecks. It's, yeah, yeah. Mum's not happy about it, but you know, I see a wreck, I have to go in it, unfortunately. <laughs> obviously, I obviously I do all the safety stuff, check I can go through it and yeah, you know, plan it. You seem pretty competent in the water too. Like um like yeah, obviously like, you know, your dad's sort of giving you that 
that that contagious froth, and then you've sort of but you've you've developed your own level of competence too. How long did it take you to start getting comfortable? Um, I guess I've always been comfortable in the water, but I remember as a kid like being scared of what's underneath me and like, oh, I'm not going over there or a bit of seaweed touch me. And then it just it obviously just grew from there. I actually went to Australia and done my I was there for a year, done my uh paddy, done my spearfishing course where I got my Ada one. Oh wow. Uh, and then that that was me hooked. Uh and I came back to Scotland and I had my three mil wetsuit. Like, well, <laughs> screw it, I'm gonna go for it anyway. Wow. There's me going out with all these locals. They're a five mil, seven mil. I'm like, I'll be fine. I'll be fine. I was, like, I was doing max was an hour and a half. Yeah. And I was still getting out, shooting fish. So I was happy. Wow. Um, but it was just killing the love, killing the love. You know, I'm going out, getting cold, not really seeing a lot of stuff sometimes. And then I went to New Zealand and that's just what gave me the confidence because you had to have it. Mm. If you know what I mean, like to do the job, I had to be confident in the water, know my own body. And you're, you're dragging stuff, you know, kits full of kinna mm. which weigh a hell of a lot up the surface and there's so many times you're nearly having shallow water blackouts and <laughs> all this but there's f- there's like five of you so you're, you're always looking after each other but if there's any one way to understand your body is to push it to the limits unfortunately and i, I guess like i said it just drilled the confidence into me and because i commercial dive for work now i'm i'm literally in the water every day of the week and wow. if i go out on the weekend i'm Spearfishing. What are you doing for work? Uh, so I'm a commercial buyer. I work a lot on fish farms. We do construction and ship husbandry. Wow. Uh, so a couple of months ago, we were building a pier, and that was like three hours a day underwater every day for God knows how long. I don't even want to. I've done hundreds of hours underwater on that. So you underwater welding and doing everything, or yeah, yeah, wow, yeah, everything like that. Um, which again, like. I just love it. it. Doesn't feel like I'm underwater anymore. It's just I go and do it. It's quite a weird concept when I think about it. Like now, walk, diving in the water is like walking down the street yeah. to me, and it's, it's not like to my own trumpet, but it's a weird feeling when some people would never ever think about going in the yeah, water. Yeah. I remember when I was 18, and I, I I went through to my instructor's level and recreational stuff. I I started off with SSI, and I went dive control specialist. Then I switched over to paddy and went through to uh, master diver trainer or whatever the hell it was. Yeah. And then um, I really wanted to get into commercial diving because like there was a thousand people in New Zealand uh, employed in the scuba diving industry from one end of the country to the other. And I'd imagine the Shetlands yeah. is even smaller. Like New Zealand's got population 5 million Shetlands is population yeah. 24,000. Well, that's, that's the problem. People don't want to come up here and work. They, I mean, I was like that. I was like, I don't want to do fish farms. I'm like, where's Shetland? I don't know. Yeah, and then I, I came up here and I did my first year, and and I was like, right, I want to go travel for a bit. And that's how I ended up in New Zealand. Yeah, but I don't know. I got drawn back to Shetland, so I've been back here for four years now, five years. Yeah, mate, that's a um, magic looking place. Oh, it is. I recommend anybody to come and experience it. And the, the good thing is, I mean, during winter the weather's pretty miserable, <laughs> but if you look at it a different way of when it when the weather hits and you've got like 60 mile an hour winds and you're watching waves like completely cover 100 meter tall cliffs oh it's special like, it's insane amazing yeah, yeah i remember going out with a mate of mine with our rucksacks and our waterproofs and like gardening gloves and hanging onto the rocks with our gopros on our heads trying to film it <laughs> these waves just hit hitting the rocks and just like needles in the eyes oh, yeah. and that's what i love experiencing Mm-hmm. For me, like when I was eighteen, and I and I wouldn't wanted to do it so much. Um, I got really hard discouraged out of it by commercial divers that were working in the industry. They were talking about how tough it was to get into, and you know, like they said, like if you wanted to be a, like an underwater welder, then you generally. Start I mean, I wouldn't off, recommend anybody to do it. Yeah, <laughs> they say like generally you start off as a welder, then you learn the underwater stuff, and they said you've kind of learned the underwater stuff, but you don't know how to weld and. I mean, talk talk to yeah. that, like your skills development, if you can, of doing that. Yeah. Uh, I mean, I guess through your, your, you do your course, it's pretty much a crash course. Learn to breathe underwater in a big hat and, <laughs> you know, here, drill this concrete block for, block for 10, 15 minutes and see, we'll time you, you know. <laughs> when you're doing the course, you're like, everything matters in that 10 minutes, get that concrete block drilled or whatever. 
Whereas when I look at it now, you know, we all laugh about it because you're an idiot just under there, just drilling a concrete block for whatever, you know, to get a couple of minutes on the wall and be the top diver. Yeah, yeah. But all that's doing is just teaching you to blow bubbles and stay alive. When you learn to dive is when you get a job and they throw you in, go do this. And it's a, it's a good, if you're, it's more of a common sense thing. You're kind of just an underwater laborer mm, mm. if uh, diving. Uh, but I've done jobs where I've seen a whole fishing net in the back of a boat, mm. like the whole the whole thing with fish in it as well. And there's seals coming in, trying to eat the fish. It's just nuts. And you've got to try and get this net out and you're starting with a tiny little backstabber knife like that. And it's, you, you know, you can't just cut one place. You have to work it out. It's like a mental puzzle. Yeah, yeah. And doing that for three, four hours and your brain's just nuts. But so for the, the skill sort of thing, it's, just trial and error but the diving is a diving and the job's a job so the diving is the only way you get to the job is kind of how to look at it yeah and i'm self-taught welding and stuff i actually got stuck on an island uh i took a long holiday and the boss wasn't happy with me so he banished me to this island to help weld slip rails for the boat the ferry they bring it out oh yeah, yeah. during the winter up and mm. down this so we had to weld the new uh railway sleepers on them and i was there for two months and 54 people lived there it's called fair isle and that uh sent me a bit nuts but i definitely had a lot of time to practice the welding wow um and i've just taken that into hey can you go do that underwater i was like yeah sure and then <laughs> so i've taught myself to do it underwater as well cool and so yeah wow I, I, it's like water i mean you're losing manual dexterity when you're under because you've got gloves on and the nature of it and then water yeah. so much denser than air so there's it's kind of a few things at play um is a lot of it monkey see monkey do how, i mean how how much different is welding underwater than above i mean it's completely it is completely different like it, you have to put the welding rod into the metal and push it whereas every every time you're out the water you know you just hover it above the metal you know so everything's like kind of opposite to what you usually do but you also have to remember you've got you, you're then using electricity in the water. Yeah, yeah. I mean, nine times out of ten, I've just kind of electrocuted myself and just dealt with it. <laughs> like, because you're in the circuit. I was in the bottom of the hull of a boat, and I physically had to be in this location, and I was in the circuit. And maybe I probably should have checked where I was putting electrodes and stuff like that. But you're just getting a, a little zap. When you're well, well, salt well salt water is but... non-conductive, and you've got rubber on. Um, is, is there any other non-conductor yeah. you're matting up in any way? Like, uh, yeah, you kind of do everything possible, but for some reason, it always finds a way. <laughs> like, I, I don't know how to describe it, but yeah, like I've got, you know, the washing up gloves you get, so I'll always put them on over my or under my neoprene gloves. So technically, that's my hands done. You're in a rubber suit, yeah. you know, as you're not in the circuit, but I could tell you something was fizzing down there. Mm. Have you ever been in the water when like lightning struck? Because uh, a lot of people talk about uh, it, and that seems like a crazy experience too. Not at work. I've only ever seen lightning once in Shetland, mm. which is a weird, yeah, a right. weird thing. Because it's, um, it's it's wet there. Like you, you get you, you're getting massive yeah, plant formations coming off. And, I don't think lightning needs land to build up, doesn't it, or the clouds to build up? Yeah, but if you're on islands too, like you know. You guys, you got. I'm imagining you're getting clouds straight off the Atlantic, or even from you know the, the north. Oh, uh, we have Arctic. clouds, yeah, constantly. And sometimes, as, as soon as they hit any sort of rise, uh, like yeah, as soon as you know the clouds are rising, therefore precipitation yeah. drops, doesn't it? So uh, I thought, I thought it maybe be pretty Shetland's wet just not tall enough. Yeah, <laughs> is it not? Is it not tall? I, th- I thought you had like rolling hills, and you got Shetland oh, ponies, nice. don't you? And, all the other stuff. Yeah, and they're really short, so if that tells you something. <laughs> <laughs> uh, um, we have hills, yeah, but it's it's a hill. You know, we've got no mountains. We've got no nothing. We've got no trees, really. Um, if you want to go have a fire down the beach, you have to go nick a load of pallets from the shops <laughs> and get, get them going. So you don't have driftwood there? I mean, there. acquire pallets. Uh, very rarely. Yeah, wow. Very interesting. Yeah, it's a it's, it's a crazy place. Mm. All right, let's talk about spearfishing there. So you got you got big cod, you've got halibut. Have you got ling there? 
Uh, we have lots of Ling. Uh, not so many Halibut or they're catching them at depth. The problem yeah. is they're catching a lot at depth. Uh, um, I I remember when I first started spearfishing here and I got so frustrated because I wasn't finding the fish. And then one time I was like, oh, I'm going to try this spot. Screw it. And I went in and there was just shoals of Pollock and they're the size of my arm. And I was just like, plink, gone, plink, gone. Another one. I'm like, there is fish in Shetland. This is like, you know, a eureka moment. Uh, and ever since then, I've just been chasing those marks. What's the wildest mark I can find? There's probably a fish there. Uh, and I found the fish. I found the pollock. Um, I know the ling, the, the cod, they're, they're, they're everywhere. It's just the depths. You know, you're talking, everything's everything's good, probably below 20 meters. Yeah. And I'm I'm usually all out myself. So it's, you know, I, I've done it. You know, I shouldn't do it, but I've done it. I've made sure I've got someone on the surface, but it doesn't really help you. But uh, so I'm finding areas that I, I'm shooting fish, sometimes eight meters. You know, I'm shooting I shot a 11 pound pollock the other day in 10 meters of water. That's a good fish. So um, it's, it's finding the places that the fish are. What's to say that the cod aren't going to be at 10 meters or the, the ling aren't going to be at 10 meters. But mm. I'm also trying to learn how the different fish species hunt. Like pollock, I know. Uh, cod, I've I've shot a couple and I've watched them, but I've still not tuned on and where they'll necessarily be. What's their tendencies? Ling, I've been told that they'll if you put a rod down with just a big lure on it, as soon as you hit the seabed, poof, you're on to a ling. Mm. It, it's completely nuts. But why am I not going down? And they just everywhere then. Yeah. You know, so in my head, it's like, what am I going to do now to? try and get these i've used flashes the same sort of thing as you would for a rod and line mm-hmm. um and i was trying that out the other day uh, and at a very lingy spot big boulders everywhere that they can hide under and stuff like that and i was getting nothing coming into it uh, i need to spend more time doing it but hey, are they what is there a spearfishing record for lingcod for ling uh yes it's i think it's only two pounds or maybe a bit more uh, they grow massive too, don't they? Oh, yeah. I caught a 14 pound one just when I'd done a huge spearfishing trip up there. We took the rod and line. We're in the, it was a muckle flugger. And if anybody's listened to this from Shetland or the UK, they'll know where this place is. It's notorious for rod and line fishing. People will pay to go up there, you know, whatever to go and shoot, catch fish. The record cod was caught there. It was like 58 kilos the other year. Yeah. Wow. Uh, and they're catching monster safe. And it's all the sort of thing you see in Norway. So me being me, I was like, yeah, I'm going to head up there and I'm going to shoot all these fish. First person to do it, not a problem. And uh, so I got Sky Spearfishing, who's known on social media, but he's called Arian. They, I, I trust him, right? Get up here. We're going to go do this big mission. And we had one weather window. So we got straight off the 12-hour ferry, Shetland. We shot all the way up to Unst, which is the most northern isle. So two ferries to get there. And we had half a day weather window to do this and i'm like right screw it let's go we got the thundercat ready everything in there we headed out and he his face was just like a big happy baby you know what i mean and uh we, we got in and the first fish he shot was around eight pounds first fish i shot was over nine pounds and we're like you know this is insane but the tide was just the tides are just ripping you get seven knot tides there you, it, people are terrified to go there and everybody advised me probably shouldn't go there but I've done a lot of diving in tides, being in tides. I spend my life in the water. So I'm, you know, if it's not safe, I'll not do it, but you have to try. Um, so we burnt out quickly trying to dive these marks, you know, trying to fin and stay in one spot. So we went out and done some rod and line fishing and Arian's a big rod and line fisherman as well. He's like, watch this, put this lure on, which actually looked like a puffin, uh, the little puffin birds we yeah, get up yeah, here. Yeah. Yeah, and he says so. Apparently, up here, the fish are eating the puffins as well. I'm like, yeah, yeah, okay. <laughs> they drop. I drop. He's like, I'll okay. I'll let you drop it. So I poof to the seabed, and then like 20 seconds, I was on. I was like, holy crap, this feels big. And then we're bringing this ling up as we're getting sucked back into the tide, where it's like the narrow two bits of the island. And you're talking where the tide hits the wind, it just builds. Yeah, and it was three, four meter waves. Wow. And he's like, you better get this fish up quickly. It's like, I'm trying, I'm trying, I'm trying. You know, so eventually I get this fish up and it's a big old ling like that. He throws it in the boat. I get the engine started and we just 
get the hell out of there. But <laughs> what an experience. And like we weren't even fishing the, the crazy marks. So, so my whole mission is to learn to spearfish up there because the fish are there. The, the, the big safe, or also known as cold fish, are like your, your blue water fish, your pelagics, your, you know, they're, they're like Shetland tuna is what I call them. Mm-hmm. Uh, and they're, they're catching them 20 pounds and stuff like that. Wow. And it's just, if I can bring them high enough in the water column or whatever way that, and they will feed on the surface. It's like, just like chasing tuna, you see the birds, you go. Yeah. Um, if I can do that, the, the British record for a safe is around four pounds. Oh, or more. wow. You smashed it. Yeah. And you just got to get on. Yeah. I mean, that was my thought, but <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, I didn't get that far, but we had a long day and we're like, we better play it, play it safe in a location like this. Great news, guys. Adam Stern has made his freedivingfamily.com courses available at a discount for the Noob Spiro community. If you get on freedivingfamily.com, use the code Spiro, you'll get 20% off any course. There's a bunch of sick courses on there. There's an equalizing uh, stage one. There's an equalizing advanced techniques um, video there. They're two of my absolute favorites. If you have any problems with equalizing, go to freedivingfamily.com. Get Adam's course and use the code Spiro to get 20% off any course. Check it out at freedivingfamily.com. Today's Noob Spiro podcast is brought to you by Audible. Get a free audiobook download and a 30-day free trial at noobspiro.com forward slash audible. Over 180,000 titles to choose from for your iPhone or Android phone. Get amongst it, noobspiro.com forward slash audible. Free trial, free book. No brainer. That's noobspiro.com forward slash audible. In the world of freedive spearfishing, there's no magic breathing technique that's all of a sudden going to get you down and shoot massive fish at depth and holding big bottom times. But there is a way to do it safer and smarter, take down more fuel to maximize the time that you have there. Learn at noobspiro.com forward slash Ted with Ted Hardy from Immersion Freediving. If you take down more fuel, you can stay for longer. Learning to take a bigger breath is not such a big deal. Ted breaks it down for you with a free online course, noobspiro.com forward slash Ted. Take down 20 to 30% more air just by learning how to take a full breath. Again, learn how to do it free at noobspiro.com forward slash Ted. You reminded me of a few things when you were talking about massive current through passes. Like um, when I was younger, I, was, I think I was doing my instructors at the time, there was a scuba diving group went through a narrow pass in the Marlborough Sounds, which is the top of the South Island in New Zealand, and uh, yeah. massive current swing through there. And this whole group got sucked down into this hole in a vortex. Um, and the ones that survived registered 100 metres uh, depth on their on their, um, on their their depth. You know, it shows you your max depth, even yeah, on the yeah. old school gauges. Um, I think two people died, two people got bent, and three survived without you know, obvious injury, but obviously a traumatic experience for all of them. Uh, um, but the, when you were talking about what you're doing up there, it sounds very familiar. And like, sometimes I think we, we lose track of just how powerful a big body of water moving through a narrow channel is. It's like so oh, yeah. scary. Sounds like you've got a bit of that up there. Oh, tides are here insane. You know, I, I've jumped in salmon cages to inspect the cages and you just get sucked to the side. Oof, like that and you're in all this dive gear and you pretty much can't move you're clawing your way around this cage to inspect it wow and and the thing the thing is everybody was kind of like you know you'd be stupid to go there you and it but i i understand the tide i understand everything it's, it's the way you have to look at it mm. you know when we, when we got a bit too tired it's like we're done we're done here because if you push it in a location like that things can go wrong um the, the other thing is that it's, if the weather turns there, it gets gnarly very quickly. Yeah. And the good thing that the, the boat I've got is quick. So if you need to get in and out a location, you can do that. And it's all learning what you can push and you can't push. Mm-hmm. Um, and I've done a lot of diving and tides in New Zealand. I remember we finally got to do some spearfishing after a day's work. And uh, I was with a mate called Jared and he broke his Ruku that day. So he's, he's still done the rest of the day diving with one fin on. <laughs> Absolute nutter. And then uh, it's like, right, we'll go spearfishing. You, you come in, Jared. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Why not? Yeah, I'll jump in. And 
I remember the tide being so strong that we were diving on the eddy. And uh, he's just like, yeah, yeah, I'll come in too. The, the boys just said on the boat, okay, well, if you get stuck in the, the tide and sucked away, just shoot fish along your way and we'll pick you up at the end. I'm thinking like, are you serious? <laughs> and I, I looked at this tide, it was like a river going around this island. I was like, screw it. Yeah, okay, let's go in. And uh, I had my float line and next thing I know, I look at Jared and my float line's starting to tug like that. Jared's just on that bit. You know when the, it's going over the rocks and it's just about to go really fast? Yeah. He's there, he's waving his gun in the air like this and I'm just like, crap, he's about to get swept away. So I put my float further back. He grabs onto my float like this. <laughs> you just see one fin in the air and I, I managed to swim to the rocks as fast as possible. I'm pulling him out this current. And we spoke about that the other day and it, you have to be in situations like that to learn to dive those situations. Yeah. I mean, there wasn't really anything that was going to happen if you did get sucked away. You just, like they said, you just go along for the ride and we'll pick you up in a bit. But in your head, you're thinking like, you know, there's probably hundred sharks around this little bit of white water, you know, everything can go wrong. Spiros are a risk tolerant but bunch in general, but you sound like you're <laughs> extra risk tolerant, man. Like you've had some sketchy times. Uh, far out. Yeah. I mean, I mean, it's maybe just me getting in. I always manage to get in these silly little, uh, silly, silly little outcomes where I'm like, oh, what am I doing? But the thing is, I'm, I always treat it with confidence, but respect. Yeah. And there's so many times I'm just, I'll call the shots before pushing it. Even if I get, I was speaking to this with a friend the other day. I was like, if I get a funny feeling in the yep. water, like your mind's gone, you know, you're not going to dive as good. Yeah. Uh, and what, what it was, I was spearfishing and all the birds were hitting the water yeah. like that. Their feet and my head, my head computed that as, that sounds like killer whale. Oh yeah. I'm like, well, that doesn't sound good. <laughs> so I'm just like, right, I'm out of here. <laughs> even though I knew it was fine and everything like that, but my diving wasn't going to be as good and I'm out myself. So I think I, uh, I just sent you a text. <laughs> you put your phones coming through. Um, yeah, nah, I, 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 um, I get it, man. And sometimes with, with, with certain types of fear, uh, you can't rationalize it away. If you've got like a, a level of anxiety, everything else just seems to ramp up as well. Like one thing, like for me, diving in the colder water is I, when I start to get cold, I don't, it takes a while for me to get cold, but once I get cold, I find it, it takes me quite a long time to warm up and it's really difficult to dive. Yeah. 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 I mean, it's a complete game changer. Now I'm using a seven mil, a seven, seven mil long johns as well. So I've got the extra, the bit on the chest. Um, but you, once you get cold, it's hard to fight off those thoughts and I remember getting that in New Zealand as well we were diving the, the South Island so we'd go from the North Island to the South Island across the Straits uh, and like you said diving those tidal areas when you just spoke about them like yeah. mm, pretty sure I've, I've been in some of them I remember straight. seeing the muscles like green yeah. muscles the size of my arms just like hanging on for yeah. dear life uh, but I remember getting so cold and like having to come back to the boat and run about and get back in and you know and it, it's amazing how all that plays in your mind. So you, uh, you, 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 you'll bust good. out a bit of cardio to try and warm back up, like the old school sort of just movement, getting the blood flowing again to to warm up. Oh uh, yeah, just swim like swim like an yeah. idiot. A- anything, uh, anything that happened, commercial diving, like you, the things would go. You you get you get hungry, your brain wouldn't work. You'd get, oh, mate. Sometimes I used to go like super depressed, and the whole world's ending. No food. Yeah. My brain's just like just blood blood sugar you know, crashing out as well, probably. Uh, yeah. And like the only way I would fight that is I'd maybe go have a little snack because you don't want your stomach acid to build up. Yeah. So sometimes we'd just have a couple of pills to stop the stomach acid and that's yeah. it. And once you fought that, you're diving with, your diving was so good. Once you've kind of fought the, the stomach acid build up, your body was in prime diving mode. Um, but to get rid of the thoughts, I just had to act like an idiot. I'd go hide in the kelp and stuff and wait for the supervisor to go down, start collecting kidney. And there's me just chewing on the seaweed and stuff like that. <laughs> acting like a, an idiot and he'd just look at me underwater like that and you just see a lot of bubbles come out and start laughing <laughs> and for me and that, that's a good thing with a bunch of lads like that you you know what situation you're in and you just act like idiots and mm. to get you through those little bits mm. and the, the things you have to do as you know you probably do quite a lot of silly stuff in the water 
you're reminding me of like sitting in a classroom when I was 15 or 16 and then yeah. just like, you know, I should have been out at sea. I should have just been in amongst it, working, doing stuff because like I was of no use to a teacher in a yeah. classroom of 30 sitting down doing nothing. You know, like I, I find the ocean's calming and it just, it, it gives you an outlet for all that energy because I don't know, I remember just having more than, you know, more than, more than most. And uh, yeah, I mean, I was the same. I hated school. And uh, I started by going out to a shooting estate. So we've got big estates in the UK, as you probably know, and a lot of pheasant shooting and stuff like that. And I started going out helping on one of them. Then when I turned 16, I was like, screw you, school, I'm out of here. And I went and lived on the estate and became a gamekeeper. Wow. And that's me. i am got my own traps. I'm going around. I'm shooting stuff, you know, eating, eating what I shoot, looking after the estate. Yeah. You know, put on big shoot days and stuff. And that, uh, you know, school obviously teaches you a lot, but that taught me a lot more, I feel. Yeah, I mean, yeah. my, my my writing and my reading and my maths is pretty terrible, but it was probably, <laughs> probably going to be terrible anyway, right? So, Yeah, yeah. Well, like for me, I repeated a year in high school and my percentages in the exams went backwards. So you, you can just literally like you, if you're not going to do any good there, then sometimes it's worth just going, right, I, I might as well just rock it and go do something that where I am going to be good. Because I don't know, you yeah. see a lot of 15, 16, 17 year old kids, particularly males. I don't, I don't know if it's a testosterone type thing, but like if they get locked into school system too and they're not performing well, and then they're made to go continuously until they find some sort of alternative pathway out of there. It can kill their confidence too. Like you, you yeah. start to, f- you can feel like an idiot, and it's just because you're in the wrong context. And yeah, that's exactly how I felt. Like it was as soon as I went out onto the estate. I was 16 years old, turning 17, and I was taking clients out from Belgium and Spain, deer stalking around the estate, and I was helping put on shoot shoot days for the owner of the state who used to be a member of parliament, like it, you know, I was doing that at that age. I bet the teachers at school probably didn't know that I could do something like that. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. it's, it's, I mean, I couldn't count the pheasants at the end of the day, but that didn't matter, did it? So, yeah, yeah I don't know. There's something jarring. There's some, there's, um, you know, I mean, these are deeper f- philosophical conversations too, but like, yeah. I feel like sometimes that, that rite of passage too, like is missing in our culture as well. We, we've, we've tried to create other alternative ways of doing it. And sometimes like, you know, the alternative sort of spearfishing hunting type lifestyle, we have quite a good, um, I don't know, respect for each other. And, uh, and there's like this camaraderie that helps us sort of bridge that gap from being a kid and moving into being a, an adult. Yeah. And I feel like it's missing in our society in general. I mean, yeah, I mean, it, it shows with the people that comment and stuff on the shooting the fish and the shooting the animals and stuff because they can't relate. You know, it, gone are the days of you go and shoot your dinner. Mm. It, it's, it's how it feels, and mm. and I, my I don't really have anybody in my family like my mum and dad weren't really shooters apart from my uncle and my granddad. So my mum tells me stories of you know, go into the fridge and freezer and eels fall out because my uncle's been eel fishing all night or <laughs> pheasants, pheasants hanging up in the, the outbuilding. And so my mom doesn't, my mom doesn't really like guns and she doesn't like shooting, but she loves eating it. So yeah. like, she's more than happy for me to prep it. She's not too happy when I come home every year for Christmas and put deer on the table like that. I say, mom, I need to sort this out. <laughs> so I've now, I've now worked out that dad's bike rack for fixing his bike hangs a deer very well. So he's also not too happy. This lends well to a, a mutual friend of ours, uh, Ben Honky. He's got uh, – he just sent me a care package of some of his spice rubs and stuff. You love a good cook-up. Your YouTube channel, Souls on Tap, has got plenty of cook-ups. I remember watching one of your mates do a sort of a, a – a, a, you slow mode it too, like he's sprinkling some of them. Oh, yeah, I had, to, of, I had to make that as cheesy as I could get it, really. I loved it, loved it. But um, I haven't tried out any of Ben's um, stuff yet, So, but it's um, – Honky Outdoors, he's made Australian made um, sort of spice packages. Some of it's for venison, some of it's for small game, some of it's for fish. Um, how, how have you found it? And how do you know Ben? Uh, so I just started following him on Instagram, really. And then he kind of reached out to me and, you know, talks back and forth. And then the next day, he's like, What's your address? I'm sending you a care package. I'm like, What? This is amazing. Like, thank you. You know, it's like, What's your address? And I'll send you a care package. So it kind of just had like, <laughs> <laughs> so I said about a cap and stuff like that. And 
I love I love uh, meeting new people and creating contacts like that. So it certainly spices over. And for me, it's you know what it's like when you're cooking in the bush and stuff like that. You need mm. something quick. You don't want all these jars of I'm going to put this with this, this with that. And frankly, I, I only cook by try trial and error. Yeah, yeah I'm pretty I'm bad at following that. recipes. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, that much seems like good. Yep. Yeah. yeah, the packet is trial and error done for us. I just put a cookbook together with seventy-two people like you. Imagine trying to knuckle <laughs> them all down for quantities. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm anyway. the same. I just, I just guess, and I always end up with way too much food. Mm. Um, but I, I do love the spices, and I've, I still got them, uh, and they live in my pickup. My pickup's good to go for cooking everything. It's got a fridge in it. I've, the back seats out i didn't need them anymore that's got a fridge in gas bottle the whole lot now <laughs> mission ready so everywhere i go yeah so i love cooking with them and i'm hoping uh maybe to go out and meet up with ben and do some hunting and cooking with him yeah. at some point he's uh, a cool guy sort of just a just your, your yeah your average sort of dad um getting down there in new south wales he loves sort of hunting state forest and um and then getting in and spearing as well he's it seems like he's still very much a noob in the water but he he's he's, um he's just got that contagious energy you can't help but sort of like the guy yeah but what i love is is the passion that he's still going at it and and it's trying to deal with the whole family as well you know i see his instagram stories and he's still in the gym at five o'clock in the morning like you know respect to him for going out and doing all this and he's very good at messaging back and being involved and you know so i'd love to go and do some hunting with him and learn from him and probably learn how to do some spices <laughs> <laughs> yeah hey um one thing that ben and you both share is um you've got dirty water around um you do seem to get more than your fair share of clean stuff up there but um you seem to color grade some of your dirty water footage quite well how do you do that what editing software is um so I'm using Final Cut, and it's nice that you said that because I don't know if I am doing it well. Uh, ah. But it, it's a very fine line. I've just started filming with uh, hi, the higher resolution, basically, and I'm finding editing it less. Um, yeah, nice. But it's all about taking the color out. I don't use filters either because it's hard if you're, you've got a scene where you're in the water and then your camera comes out the water. Yeah. It's two well, different cut it. things. So you, Yeah, and I find it an absolute nightmare. So I'm doing a little bit less but mm. trying to edit it so the underwater scene you can just edit at one click and just take the color out of it and I'm, you know depending on what the water is sometimes i've got crystal clear water here but it's green mm. or i've got crystal clear water here and it's blue yeah, or you've yeah. got crystal clear water and it's it's neither it's and it's then you have to learn what color yeah, you're yeah. doing and it's still very new to me so again it's just trial and error i'm using davinci resolve for color grading and um, it's super slick in terms, but it's really yeah. painful. Like it took me probably I don't know eight or ten hours mucking around, like just getting a handle on it. But then you sort of yeah, you can add these these um, corrector nodes in the color grading section, and then you can pretty much just control C, control V on similar clips. So let's say like yeah. you've got a fifteen minute video, and all the underwater footage is taken from the same day with relatively similar lighting, you you can apply the same color correction to all of those clips and then worry about the rest of them. So it's just a faster way to do it. Yeah. It's, it's, it's the same in final cut, but you're winning if you can get all the footage pretty much the same. Yeah. yeah. If you know what I mean? Like I it, it's the sunlight, it's everything like that. I've yeah, just, yeah. I've, so I've just had this massive week spearfishing doing the muckle flogger trip and Aaron put sky fishing spearfishing was up for the whole week. And I filmed the whole week. Uh, it was so emotional. I, oh, The Thundercat had a pretty bad day on the second day because I took it out in 40 mile an hour winds, <laughs> filled the fuel tank up full of water. Oh, we got no. home. I mean, we, we shot some mega fish. I'm editing that footage at the minute. Uh, but yeah, wouldn't start the next day. So thankfully we went out on Murray's bigger boat. Um, but I, we had gotten the fish and filleted them in his garage and I was playing with the light in the camera. So, you know, when it flickers like that, and I was like, I don't know how to get this out, so I'll just try it. And I had the brightness up because it was dark, and I left that on the rest of the trip. And I'm like, oh, no, I've ruined all this footage of, like, two days filming. Oh. And so it's bright. I'm pretty sure I'll be able to edit it out because I edited some of the stills that I got off of it. 
And yep. Because it lets so much light in, the stills just popped. The bits oh, where the sun sick. reflected on things, uh, it's out. a little bit shiny, but the the water, I'll send you some later, just yeah, looks yeah. amazing. So I'm hoping I can still edit that. And then it almost didn't really matter because I lost the Hero 10 at 10 metres in two metre deep kelp. I did, didn't put it on my wrist and I'm like, oh no, this can't be happening. I have all this footage is on this GoPro and this was a mega panic moment. So I uh, brought the old kinediver out with me and just dived and dived and dived. I bought the new Hero 10 Black and I've got a Hero 7 and I learned quite a bit about the Hero 7 um, and then the Hero 10 is though it's a larger housing so you need, I need to buy a different yeah. um, super suit for it and all that sort of stuff. A lot yeah. of Spiros are buying the older models because they're that slightly smaller unit and it's just yeah. so less movement on your I, head. Yeah, so the Hero 10, I've never really put my head because you do have that extra drag. I actually still film with a Hero 4, mm. my, my wow. old school camera. Yeah. Um, one of the batteries is slowly dying on it, but it's it's still the old faithful. The battery will last the longest. For some reason, it'll say it's dead and it'll still work for another half an hour. And it's got the nice loud beeps, so you're, you're doing it on your head. It's a smaller camera. I'm filming in, you can film in 4K with it, but I'm filming in 2.7. Yeah, yeah, that's what I uh, film in too. Um, still get 50 frames per second too, don't you? Yeah. So the other thing I screwed up on was I put 30 frames a second on the Hero 10. <laughs> So, I mean, it's fine, but as soon as you want to try and slow some stuff down, you can only do it so much. Are you, have you got your settings to NFSC or PAL? Because that changes uh, your frame rates. Not a clue. You know about that? I uh, do now. <laughs> well, Dan Man told me about it. He, there's a different standard. So, like, PAL is like, I don't know, I think it's Asia Pacific or something. And yeah. the frame rates are like 25, 50. And that sort of stuff. I think you can do oh, okay. 30 as well. But NFSC is like 24.1. And then I think they do 30, 60. Six, yeah, yeah. Something like that. But I know yeah. that it, so the, the 10 goes all the way up to 240 now. Yeah, wow. Oh, but not on yeah. 4K though, is it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think so. Oh, that'd just chew a bit, wouldn't it? I mean, I hope so. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but that's the thing. Giving that a go, like, yeah. You're trying to film a day and yeah, learning to I always have the camera in the housing because I'm usually doing deeper dives. Yeah. And trying to I need to learn to with big fat gloves on, press the buttons to try and change the settings is an absolute nightmare. Because there's bits that you want to film with super slow motion and there's normal bits you want to film. And you if you have it on super slow motion all day, then it's gonna be an absolute nightmare in the editing and I like how you um use slow mo like um, there's a couple of like moments in sparing that Spiros get and are they like real special frothy moments and it's like it can be a facial expression, it can be that moment before you surface, you know, but they're just these little things that they slow down in your mind but they don't always come out yeah. in a film. So and that, that's, that's, that's how I try and edit it really. You know, I like to try and you can imagine spear fishing and freediving is quite a, you could say an emotional thing to that person. Yeah, so the reasons they're doing it, and and I like to and try to edit that way, so, so people can watch it and maybe feel that sort of thing. It's the same as I have to try and put the right music with it. It doesn't always work, but in my head, I know how I want it to look. I know how I want it to feel, and it is like what you say. Those your brain goes in slow motion sometimes when you're you're down there. Yeah, but yeah. I love it when you're 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 at the bottom or and you do just zone out sometimes you feel your own heartbeat and everything like that and they're the best dives i might have one of them a day or a week or but i've been down there and i've heard my own heartbeat before and you're just wow i i it was shallow me it was shallow i mean it was seven meters and i remember i've been training for a while i was down there for like two minutes i was like oh, i'm gonna go to two and a half minutes and i very rarely do that but i knew that i could just let go of the kelp and i just drift up because i was uh weighted very light and I just zoned out and I just heard my heart beat and it was just the best. Mm. The, the next time I've actually tested if I could pee underwater because I was so relaxed and can. So that's a tough one, actually. There's a real mental hoop to jump through to pee underwater. I've, I've, had, I've spent some time trying to do that too. Isn't it unusual? We're an unusual bunch doing shit like that, aren't we? Well, yeah. I mean, 
I tell that story to a few people and you just <laughs> accepted it. A lot of people do not accept it. <laughs> <laughs> they, don't, they don't get us, bro. You don't understand me. Yeah. Even when I explained to them that it was such nice feeling. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no, it's good stuff. Boom, 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 boom. I want you in my... Oh, no. I've got... <laughs> Oh no, oops, I meant to be recording adverts for Audible. Today's show sponsors, I can't get over it. You busted me singing my favourite classic song from Venger Boys. Anyway, I've got a bunch of books that I'm listening to on Audible right now, and I reckon you should too. Uh, Breath or Breathe, I'm not sure what it is actually. I think it's Breath, The New Science for a Lost Art by James Nestor. Um, phenomenal information here about breathing. And I think James came about this sort of this idea from his background learning how to free dive. Um, check that out on Audible at noobspiro.com forward slash Audible for free. Noobspiro.com forward slash Audible. Free trial, free book. No brainer. That's noobspiro.com forward slash Audible. Do you like to penetrate? Great news. Penetrator Fins, today's Noob Spiro podcast sponsor, are tough as nails. Robust, dependable performers with beyond industry standard warranty. Communicate direct with Larry and his team 24-7 for all your fin inquiries at penetratorfins.com or at penetratorfins on Instagram. Baby spum finish. These things are smooth as silk. They glide through the water. They give you that awesome balance between power and efficiency. This is Penetrator Fins. Use the code Anubspiro to save $25 on any pair of Penetrator Fins at PenetratorFins.com. That's right, use the code Anubspiro to save $25 on any pair of Penetrator Fins at PenetratorFins.com. Blue Clawed Lobster, I don't know what you call them over there, and you guys have got crabs as well. They, um, they are a cool, a funky animal. Well, tell me about them and, and catching them. So they're kind of like your crayfish, but they fight back more. <laughs> um, I actually found I actually found this one on the pier. Uh, I live right next to the sea. Wow! Um, and so, so, for reference, um, Josh is holding up a claw that's as big as his hand. I'm taking it. You think is that a shed claw? Do you think? No, no. Oh, okay. It's been eaten. Yeah, oh, yeah. That was, so, my, that, that was my dinner. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I'm lucky that I live right next to the sea and. There's an old lifeboat pier where they keep the lifeboat and it's built with big voids, uh, void spaces, and it's usually just filled with lobsters. So I get the torch out at night, run across the road in my wetsuit and jump in with the torch. And they're, sometimes they're just sitting there, but they're so big they can't get into the creels. And I don't often take big ones at all, really. I took one, you know, as a nice little trophy one. Uh, and they always say they don't taste good or the bigger ones don't taste good. And I can tell you that they do taste good. You know, I've, I've ate plenty of lobsters now and I've, I've never, maybe I'm just cooking them wrong, but everywhere I've cooked them, they taste good no matter where it's been. Uh, they're pretty, I don't know if they're hard to catch, but I know what their nippers can do. Yeah. Oh, well, would that, would that, would that, if they grabbed hold of your finger, could they cut it off? Oh yeah. Th- this is the, the other claw that they have. Yeah. So you've got they have like a crushy claw and then a technical terms crushy claw and snippy claw. A crushy uh, claw and a snippy claw. Okay. Yeah. I like. Uh, it. I probably wouldn't want my finger in either of them really. Mm-hmm. Like, this is just like the the looks like a, a pair of scissors. Claw. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's just like a guillotine, and once they're out the water, they're and all the weights on them, you're pretty safe. But the battle trying to get them out of the hole and then back to the surface is a bit sketchy. What are they called? Um, What's their species name? What are you guys called? Are they not just called the blue lobster? I don't know. I'm typing it into Google right now. Yeah, I think they're called blue lobster, maybe. Blue lobster. Yep, that's it. Pro, pro, pro cam, pro, Procambarus aliani. Yeah. Commonly called a blue lobster. Up here, there's, I think there's plenty of them. It's just... Like I can find them easy in locations like that because you've got set holes to look. Whereas if you went out into the wild, you know, natural rocks and stuff, they'll be there, but you've got a lot bigger area to search. And the voids in this pier is quite funny because they go really far back into the pier and then there must be tunnel systems as well. And I remember putting the torch down once and there's 
it was like something of a horror film. I put the torch down and then it was like a lobster just looked at me <laughs> like that and the eyes just glowed red. It was just like he was at the back of the tunnels just following me around. I'm like, Oof. you know, and these, they're like two, three meter deep. <laughs> Far, yeah. It was pretty creepy and pitch black everywhere. And Sometimes um, in this kind of this world we live in, there's a lot of thinking that, uh, you know, m- m- man-made structure uh, and our interaction with any of the wild or natural environment is is detrimental. But this is one of yeah. these unique cases where artificial structure is actually really benefiting the local marine uh, life. Like, yeah, um, yeah. And you see it. I mean, re- marine life does not grow long. Uh, it doesn't take long to grow, sorry. No. Quite often we have to pressure wash piers and stuff uh, to inspect them and measure the thickness of the metal and the steel and stuff. And, you know, it, within a whole year, it's grown up completely. And you're talking complete marine growth. You can't see any of the metal work and the sea urchins. There's literally everything there. And unfortunately, we have to blast it all off. But that's that's the industry. Yeah. Uh, and I remember we were working up at an oil plant. And when you say oil plant, people are like, oh, there's oil everywhere. This, this <laughs> terrible. It's not because it's an oil plant. They can't have stuff like that everywhere. Yeah. But I remember doing a whole inspection dive and... I was like, right, that's me done. And I decided to come along the seabed. So look, scallops. Catch, getting my hands full of scallops. And I found a big old tube on the seabed. But screw it, I'll follow that along. And then next thing I know, I seen this big lobster at the end with its claws up like that. And I'm like, oh, crap, what do I do? Like, he's out in the open. He's looking for a fight. I just throw the scallops at him. I was like, don't need the scallops. Let's get the lobster instead. Managed to grab the lobster. And then I had to climb the ladder with all this dive gear on the hats, like 16 kilos. Yeah. And they were like, what's Josh doing? Like, what's he doing? There's me like climbing the ladder with one hand with this big <laughs> lobster in my hand. And uh, like, you're not going to eat that. You're not going to eat that, are you? And I took it home and ate it and it was great. Yeah. Like, that is, it's a lot of thing that people says, you know, like all the man-made structure we put in, everything we do is, is bad for the environment. And a lot of it probably is, but uh, once it's made and the structures you say, it does create a lot of life. Sometimes you, you you see coastlines with um just huge like hundreds of kilometers of sand, and the only thing where there's any life are the are the brief headlands and stuff that they have, and um you know artificial reefs are massive habitat um, protection for juvenile species, and then you, you you know whole ecosystems develop around them. I like seeing more of it, um. And that's just yeah. uh, it's, it's another it's another idea that needs to be more broadly communicated and the value of it to the general public. I think. Yeah, I mean that's the sort of thing. Um, when I was in New Zealand as well, like we got a lot of stick for being the the kind of divers and ripping all the life out of the ocean. And I can tell you now, a c- complete opposite. Mm. That you've got the sea urchins out there; they'll turn a whole load of reef to white rock mm. in no time. Yep. So like. But, and I was still new to it all and I was learning it all. And they took me to spots where they, where the sea urchins have been and then where we were going to collect. And it was just oof, white rock and it's, yeah. there's nothing there. You know, you got the fish passing over the big fish, yeah. but there's no, nowhere for the, the, the baby fish or anything to live. And urchin barons. And then they took me to a spot which they harvested. Yeah. Harvested the year before or something like that. And it was thick kelp again, fish everywhere, butterfish, you know, yeah. snapper everywhere and that's what a lot of people don't see mm. of like so we weren't just you know taking sea urchins out for human consumption you're actually doing it in a manageable way mm. to to help the marine life and I, I know sea urchins are still natural and you know but if they're invasive they're invasive yeah but we harvest everything like even if you're a vegan and you're eating soybeans yeah like, um they, it's particularly if they're one crop Farmed, like you're damaging the environment arguably more so than uh you know like a subsistence hunter so anyway. yeah exactly yeah and well, we have we have to eat eat at the end of the day Mm-mm. you seem like a funny bugger some of your mates are good too I, one other thing i like about your youtube channel is it doesn't feel canned like i find i have real trouble sometimes talking to a camera and just being myself and not feeling like I'm yeah. an actor or something, but you seem pretty natural and your mates seem to be able to, they get your vibe and I like that. I like that. I don't yeah. know. How, how did you I do mean, that? Is, is it just from force of habit? Uh, at first, 
I, I didn't really like speaking in front of the camera. I don't really like my own voice or anything like that. Not, not a lot of people I love do. mine. I love it. There's 200 episodes <laughs> of me just talking shit. <laughs> Um, I'm joking. I'm joking. So I, I don't know. I, yeah. I guess just the way is just uh, the way I approach a lot of it is just not to give a crap. I am who I am, and if, like I said, I create videos and everything for myself. At the end of the day, it started off just by sharing them as a family, uh, showing them to my family and friends, and then more people liked it, watched it, and you know it just grew like that. For me, every video I create is a memory for me. Mm-hmm. Instead of looking at a photo album, I've got a whole YouTube channel to watch and it's some of my best moments i've got a great headline for you for a video i scared the crap out of my mum with this video i reckon that one could go good i've done enough a lot of stuff like that oh, have you? a lot of footage i don't a lot of footage i don't see it or i'll say mum don't watch the next episode <laughs> or, <laughs> but the, the, pro- the problem is she's so used to me doing all this stuff now i remember we, we done a family trip to malta and i've it was when I first started editing. I've actually got it on my YouTube channel. And it's it's not like a proper Souls of Tapped episode as what they are now. <laughs> and uh, mum was just watching from the surface below as I'm 20 meters hiding in a wreck trying to scare the scuba divers going past. <laughs> and like we, we, we're we using weights to go to the seabed, you know. And uh, so you had maximum time in that wreck. And I was in, in that wreck for a minute and a half, just waiting. And the scuba divers have just got tunnel vision just bobbing about writing on their charts and there's me just like hiding away and so i'd like to say i've trained my mom into dealing with all my adventures now but every time i phone her it's a different story <laughs> be careful be careful so i could get hit by a bus at the end of the day so yeah mom, mom, what's diving what through mom, a wreck that's what mums do that's good yeah but it's definitely uh definitely a good title and i could probably find some perfect places to film that a lot of your hunting there in the Shetlands, you seem to like um, bottom hunting, like getting getting down onto the depth you're, you know, like wherever you, you are and um, you seem to like that style of hunting. Is that, does it lend well to the local species? Are there other t- hunting techniques that are, that are equally successful? Um, uh, so I've done a lot of, I've listened to a lot of your episodes and I can't remember who it was and he was talking about when you're hunting, just get to the bottom. You know, don't, don't waste your dive time. Don't do anything. And but I've done my some a lot of ADA courses now. And, you know, you're trained to go down like a needle as well. So you're maximizing your, your breath, you're streamlined. So I've kind of put two and two together, of just get to the bottom, streamlined, and then you've maximized your breath hold and everything. And the Pollock kind of do just come out and the RAS come out and stuff. As soon as you hit that kelp and they'll come in and I, I grunt and everything like that. And they, they like coming into that. Um, but when I've used the flash and stuff in the Northern Isles, I just drop them. And literally as soon as I dropped that, I started my dive on my breath hold and went down. And I wouldn't say that was bottom hunting. They were just coming in everywhere, actually. Like, and I was just like, plink. I could have taken two guns down and just went plink, plink like that. So I, you could say that's a different style of hunting, but that's why I was chasing the, the big coal fish and everything like that, because I wanted to, do blue water spearfishing in the Shetland Islands. And it's 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 doable. It's just I need more guys, so I'm not gonna get swept in the tide and end in Norway and I need a bigger boat. Um but I've proven that it's possible by going there and doing that. And it's still in my head like imagine blue water spearfishing in a place like this. It'd be pretty cool. 100 percent But the, the bottom hunting I, I definitely like getting in amongst the kelp. And is it the same again? I learned a lot in New Zealand of you had to do that sort of hunting. For the kingfish, you could pretty much stand out and they'll they'll come to you. Or yeah. you know, they're they're inquisitive. But you're trying to shoot the butterfish, and I know they're often quite easy to shoot, but there's a big difference between sitting on top of the kelp and then as soon as you get into it, they just come out. It, yeah. And then they're like, Oh, we're safe now. He's just there or hiding, or and it's the same with the, the snapper as well. You you know, you're actually hiding, you're hunting, you're stalking, yeah. Mm. And I do love all that aspect of it me and my instructor ron opie was his name for my first um, um scuba diving course when we were in uh, wellington on the south coast um we would often leave the scuba gear behind and head on out with the three prong and him and i had a competition one day with butterfish and i ended up pipping them i think we got four each but um i got yeah. i got the bigger one and uh and we fed the whole dive group and the backpackers that night made a 
made a, a, a turgid smell that went through the whole backpackers. But um, I loved eating them. And then last time I went back home, people were like, oh, butterfish, they're not even any good. And um, yeah. I, I liked them, though, like fresh fried and butter. Like they were just a fish that I, I love. They melt in your mouth. The, the one thing that Herbert's taught me out in New Zealand was like any fish goes, you know, there's there's a way to cook it. No, ma- no matter what, there's a way there's a way to cook it. And I was pretty trigger happy, so I was always bringing fish home. So I had to learn to cook it, didn't I? So Yeah, love it. It was really good. And I'm, we have ras here, uh, which are kind of like our butterfish. Uh, sort of thing and they're easy to shoot a lot of the time but i see them as reef keepers like they'll take 30 years to grow this that size you know whereas a pollock will take two years to grow that size um so i don't shoot many of them and they're also pretty bony and they're huge slimy scales so why bother but i understand the hunting learning to hunt it's they're good to shoot new people that you know it's good fish to learn on but so they're shot. So what do you do with them? And in that video that you said about the Dean doing the salt bay, uh, <laughs> he, um, he told me to make ceviche with them. And I remember him saying, if somebody shoots a ras, uh, I'll make ceviche. And I was like, screw it. Like there's no pollock coming in. So I just went out, sat in the seabed for as long as I could and oof, ras. It's like, right, here we go. Make me some ceviche. And, uh, it was a game changer. And I've I've never really experimented myself with making ceviche and raw fish, and I want to get more into it, but it, it completely changed it. Instead of when you cook grass, it sometimes go very mushy. Yeah, and uh, and it's very small flakes, if you can imagine. Mm. So it's and then when there's bones in there, it's unless you're making that into fish cakes, it's not as good. So a complete game changer. I say if you want to shoot a grass, shoot a grass, and just learn to prep it a different way. And yeah. the ceviche was. Amazing, to be honest. Like, I think, have you read Josh Nealon's book, the the whole fish cookbook? Uh, no, but I've watched a few videos and stuff, and I'm yeah, I'm, I've got that in the back of my head that I need to yeah. learn to do that. Well, I think his opening chapter was just like challenging our ideas about fish. So, uh, one of the massive things for me was like, w- you know, like when it comes to meat in a butchery, you go in, and even if it's beef, right, you've got. Blade steak, rump steak, sirloin steak, scotch fillet. You've got, yeah. you know, you've got four quarter stuff. You've got hind quarter stuff. You've got, you know, the um, blade. You've got, you know, there's everything. There's sh- the uh, the shanks. There's, you know, there's so many different cuts, and we we never cook all beef cuts the same. Yet with yeah. fish, we're quite happy to go. Oh, yeah, it's a fish, and then just cook them all the same. And it's like, no, no, that's not how fish work either. So, like you've got to treat every fish differently, and I think working out what what how to treat different fish in your area is is a great way to do it. And like there's like I like the Herbert's idea. There's no such thing as a trash uh, trash fish. It's just trash cooks. So yeah, and I mean, yeah, I mean, there's fish that you you wouldn't call it trash fish, but you'd you'd shoot over another one. Mm, um, mm. But at the end of the day, if you want to eat, you want to eat, and if you want to eat something good, you better learn how to to cook it like uh, people never even knew there was ras in shetland until the fish farmers asked me because they they get them in to clean the cages uh they actually put ras and lump suckers and stuff in the salmon cages like uh one of my mates was like go speak to that lad he knows everything about the sea so they are oh, do you get ras in shetland i was like hell yeah it's like what really it's like everybody said that we don't it's like they're everywhere yeah um I said, "Good luck catching them, though. You'll never, you'll never catch them and get them in the salmon cages. It's just, it's not not doable." Um, but for the for the cooking the different species and stuff, I think it's great to learn that because you have to. It's more respectful. Like when Arian came up for this trip, uh, he listens to a lot of your episodes as well, and oh, we we're wow. talking about how you respect your fish once you've you've shot it and killed it. Now. I know if people that hunt and stuff, once you shot and killed a deer or this, you you treat the meat with a lot of respect, sort of thing. You you, mm. you know, you leave it to stand, you'll then butcher it, you'll vacuum pack it, you'll have it all in the cuts. And a lot of people would just fish, they'll just chuck it in a bag, chuck it in the fridge. And I wouldn't say I was that bad, but I would sometimes just I'd often just vacuum pack it straight away. So I, I do like to be quite OCD, neat, vacuum pack, date, everything like that. But he taught me from listening to you about air drying it, you know, leaving it for a few days in the fridge. And I was like, 
okay uh so we did it and unfortunately i had to take up my whole fridge because we just shot all these fish from <laughs> flogger uh so like all well, everything else came out we didn't didn't need anything else in the fridge um yeah and we just filled the whole fridge with fish and and then he cooked a few recipes for me with the stuff that we dried and it was a game changer oh, so now dry i'm like how, how good is dry pre- preaching fish? it oh yeah uh, and like he's so i done it we done one for two one for one day fill it for two days and then some stuff for three days mm. and i mean even day one it's good yeah but day one's then, better than what, like not not dried fish like the like it, it doesn't have it can be as hard as you want to make it i reckon yeah and i mean i didn't exactly i, I had to get rid of all the oven racks as well because i didn't have oven racks <laughs> <laughs> i had no oven and i used all my fridge space <laughs> I was like screw it we're trying it um <laughs> And so he done that and Aaron used to be a chef in the Navy. So he cooked some really good dishes for me. And the difference is it became a meat. It became not just something that flaked up and went mushy. I don't know how to describe it, but it came like a steak on a plate. Mm. You know, it didn't come just like mashed potato. I know that sounds yeah, weird, yeah. but you know what yeah. I mean? It came like a proper, proper meal. You'd order a steak in a restaurant. You'd order a, a like a Pollock steak or a, kingfish steak and one, one thing I, I learned in new zealand sorry is uh the like using the different parts of the fish when we shot a big kingy you'd use the wings and everything for barbecuing and all that and they don't do that here at all so like like there are occasions i do shoot the bigger fish i was like i'm keeping the the wings you know all up around the gill plate and everything and i'll freeze them for the barbecue mm. and it's 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 great me i'll we get a lot of worms in our fish sometimes, especially the bigger ones. So the, the belly meat, I often just get rid of. Like I don't want yep. anything to do with that, unfortunately. But ah, yeah. um, and uh, that's what I love: changing people's minds, showing them what you can do with what you catch. Josh, mate, um, I have to head and pick up one of my boys. Um, I really want to chat with you again, so I'm going to lock you in yeah. for another interview. Can we do that? Yeah, yeah, for sure, yeah. All right. I want to I want to head out with um, two more subjects and then we'll just do two fast questions if that's okay. Yeah, definitely, yeah. Friends, check out oldmanblue.com.au. It's quality-made dive gear right there in the Western Australia by a really cool team. The Old Man Blue team are a very experienced bunch of frothing spiros that live the life and have done so for a number of years. Check it out at oldmanblue.com.au. Shrek, my dude, you're killing it on the Noob Spiro podcast. Every guest you get on froths on the spearing life and the actionable info is off the chain. Over here at Spearing Magazine HQ, it's the same, buddy. So many noobers are submitting their adventures, lessons learned, and pictures here at spearingmagazine.com. Just wanted to say that uh, noobers can get an international subscription here at spearingmagazine.com. They can also check out our In the Face apparel or get in a subscription to the world's greatest Spearing Magazine. Check it out at spearingmagazine.com. Shrek, thanks. Love what you're doing. Jeremy out. Equalizing problems can be something that derail you. Not today, my friend. Go to freedivingfamily.com. Check out the either the Friends or Advanced Friends or video or the Mouthful and Deep Friends or Equalization course at freedivingfamily.com. You can use the code SPIRO to get 20% off any course at freedivingfamily.com. These courses are put together by Adam Stern and a select team of, of, of legends and to help you overcome different issues and help you perform better. And some of them are extremely relevant for freedive spearing. Check it out at freedivingfamily.com. Use the code SPIRO to get 20% off any course. You made this frothy show reel for your YouTube channel. It lasts for like sort of like, I think it's like a 25, 30 second. It's banging, man. It's got really cool music. It's very highly edited. Yeah. Um, how much effort was that? Uh, a ridiculous amount. It's pretty sad when you, you spend two, three hours to do a 40 second clip. Uh, but yeah, I, I, that's what I was making last night, basically, a little trailer for this. So my Michael Flogger episode, whoever's listening, is coming out today. Um, and I decided to make a little trailer last night, or I had a song in my head, or found, and I was like, I want to make something with that. I'll send it to you over. And I made it last night, and I must have watched it about 15 times. You like it? I was like, I finally nailed it. Like, ah, nice. You know, um, nice. Then I was like, do I send it to him now? I was like, I don't know. I was like, I'll just wait. Uh, um, 
it took me a long time, but it's, it's, I mean, you're trying to get those YouTube algorithms and all this and all that crap, but it just looks awesome. Mate, awesome. your channel's going to, your channel to me is a sleeper. It's one of those ones where one video of yours is going to land. And I, after talking to Rodney Basidi from uh, Rocket Kit, I think yours, I look at your channel and I go, one of your videos is going to get picked up and then your whole channel is going to go ballistic. I'm glad I've got you when you haven't, it hasn't happened yet because I'm predicting it. So, yeah. but I'm looking. Well, I, I mean, lo- yeah, I'd like to say true. I only, I say true to myself. I mean, I do this for the love of it, but obviously I'm the sort of person, I mean, I think anybody would be, if you can earn a little bit of 100%. money or oh, you- like it'll pay for the music stuff, it'll, yep. you know, suck work off for the day, screw it, I'm going out <laughs> to be efficient. Like, yeah, that's what we all are, bro. I'm, I'm the same as you. Yeah. Um, and I'm hoping yeah. these next few episodes coming out are, are fairly big to me because of Aaron coming up. I've finally been able to push the limits. Like I said, we don't muckle flogger. Everybody said, well, our slogan was like, they said it couldn't be done. I was like, no, they said it shouldn't be done. <laughs> you know, so I hope so they I did work. that and we sp- spent the whole week and I filmed it all and I can't wait to show people. I hope it works for you, man. Um, so people check out Souls Untapped on YouTube, Instagram as well. Um, you're doing a good thing, Josh, and I, I really like it, man. I, you've got one subscriber in me, buddy. I'll try and leave uh, really good comments too. Um, <laughs> but um, what about merch, man? You've got a cool logo and you know, I see you wearing some of your yeah. own stuff. Are you going to start selling I've got, it? Um, I've got bits and pieces. There's a yeah. new hat right. that I just made up. And Are you selling made. them or um, what? Uh, yeah, I have bits and pieces to sell, Where? but I've, I've what, not people... gone as far as doing a website or oh, this. Or that. Okay. I'm just like, hey, just DM, DM me on Instagram and yeah, I'll send you one out, PayPal link. I need to get it sorted out, but yeah, send me your address and I'll get some stuff sent over. Ah, you don't have to do that, bro. I'll take it. Ah, don't worry. Side. As long as you're doing 2XL. As long as you've got a, a bed for a day and I can go out spearfishing, that'll be fine. Yeah, of course you can. Well, trying to get a day at spearfishing, like I, I got an invite for today, I have an invite for tomorrow, I've got an invite for Sunday. I, I don't think I can make any of them happy happen this weekend, but I'm going to oh, try. I'm best. craving some warmer weather and bigger fish, man. I'm, I'm, I'm at that stage. You know, I love Shetland, but shooting pollock and cold wind and rain, it needs yeah. a bit of change now. It's nice there. to mix it up. I hear what you're saying. Yeah. Um. All right, cool. So we've talked about your YouTube channel. I'm serious about getting you back for another episode because I feel like we didn't even scratch the surface and we've kind of run out of time. Um, man, last question. Could you describe what the spearfishing experience means to you in one sentence? Nice. Oh, I, knew this, I knew this was coming um, and I didn't really have time to prep. I had it all written down somewhere. Uh, it's, I, know, I don't know if it sounds cheesy, but it's like the, the art of being free with yourself and immersed in that environment. The art of being free with yourself and immersing yourself in the environment. Is that it? Yeah. All right. I feel like Along if, those I'd, lines of- if I'd given you another 20 minutes, you would have just like tightened that right up and it would have been sweet, but it's still pretty good. I'll give it to you. Oh, uh, yeah. I mean, it's, it's <laughs> all. <laughs> yeah. You understand it's, you, you can't just go and shoot a fish. You yeah. know, it goes from much deeper learning your body to le- learn in the environment to learn in the ecosystem, to learn in the fish. And that, you know, in my head, as soon as you're learning that, you're free of the world, you're free of everything. You're in that moment doing that thing. And you're you're in tune with your body. Love it, Josh. And I'm pretty dyslexic, so I cannot put words together, I'm afraid. So, Mate, you did a very good job there, and you've done a good job all episode. of had a pleasure chatting with you. So, Cheers. again, Souls Untapped on Instagram and uh, YouTube. I'm going to link it up today uh, if people want to, Check out some of the videos. I'll have a, a section up if you go to noobspirit.com forward slash souls untapped. Uh, that's U N T A P P E D. So check that out. Otherwise, I'm gonna have to get I'm gonna have to get you back on. I feel stink about cutting the interview um, a little bit short, but what can you do, brother? Oh, don't worry. Call me up anytime. I don't mind. All right. Gets me out of a day's work, so I'm happy. <laughs> Hey guys, what did you think? Jump on the Noob Sparrow community on Facebook. I'd love to hear what you thought of today's interview with Josh Haley. Um, again, follow him on Instagram at souls underscore untapped. Um, I really enjoyed getting subarctic with Josh today and uh, chatting all things um, Shetland Spearing. Hey, um, 
Next week, I'm headed off to chat with the current Australian spearfishing champions. It's Bryson Sheehy and Tim McDonald. It's a huge interview. It went for over an hour and 45 minutes, um, a ton of information. Uh, these guys were sort of uh, maybe less guarded, and they definitely shared some hot tips. Uh, so it'll be a good one to listen to, particularly if you like competitive spearfishing um, or if you are really aspire to that high end of spearfishing. These two guys are some of the best of the best. Um, they currently are the absolute best of the best in Australia. They won the PS comp, and we chat about what happened over their three days of competition. Um, I'm still in WA, care of patron listeners um, just like you. There's 52 patron listeners who support the podcast on an episode by episode basis. If you want to do that, go to patreon.com forward slash noob Spiro and consider jumping on and supporting the show. Um, but there's never any obligation, guys. If you just share the podcast with your mates, you froth on it and maybe buy some gear over at noobspiro.com. Any way you want to support the podcast, it's always welcome. Uh, but if you do want to become a patron, patreon.com forward slash noob Spiro. That's it for me. Um, Next week, you're going to start hearing some of my West Australian episodes. I've got a couple of legends coming up, Barry Paxman, Finn Rushworth, and, uh, yeah, they're coming straight after the Australian Spearfishing Champions episode. All good, guys. That's it for me. Catch up. Today's episode was an absolute banger, and so is our major sponsor, Adreno. Visit them at adreno.com.au. They have a huge range of equipment. You can find it at adreno.com.au. Use the code NoobSpear at checkout. When you shop online, you can save $20 on every purchase over $200. You can even use that code in-store at some of their huge mega stores Australia-wide. Price be guarantee on any Australian spearfishing equipment price. Again, visit them at adreno.com.au. Use the code NoobSpear. The NoobSpear podcast is incredibly proud to be partnering with Neptonics.com. It's solid gear that works, equipment you can rely on. It's the very best in spearing gear from around the planet. Neptonics is also the one-stop shop for all your spearfishing gear, particularly in the US. They've got free shipping on all orders over $99 in the US. Furthermore, you can use the code NOOB10 to save 10% off on your entire shopping basket at Neptonics.com. Use the code NOOBSPIRIT at Neptonics.com. Neptonics.com.